Okay. Oh, we're live. We're live. Okay. <laughs> um, so I'm Julie O'Donoghue. I'm with the Times Picune and NOLA.com. I cover the state legislature, and I will be covering the um, sentencing and criminal justice reform efforts uh, between now and June 8th, um, and probably after. <laughs> Um, and we're here with Flozell Daniels Jr., who was a member, the governor's appointee to the state task force that looked at this issue um, for 10, 10 months. Yeah, almost 10 months. Yeah. yeah. Um, with the assistance of um, the Pew Trust in Washington, D.C., that did a lot of uh, data analysis for the task force about what exactly could be done to bring down Louisiana's highest in the world incarceration rate. Right. So. Thanks for joining us. Well, thanks for having me. Um, so you have been active on criminal justice issues. It sounds like a lot. You're on the public defender's board. Sure. And uh, you've done a lot of things. Could you give us a little, a little bit of background of other efforts you've been involved in? Sure. As you pointed out, I am a member of the Louisiana Public Defender Board, so I've had a chance to really um, understand the importance of uh, public defense um, in making a just and fair criminal justice system. I have for years been on the policy side of this work in the late 90s working in the mayor's office um, in um, uh, the early 2000s at Tulane University uh, helping support prisoner reentry programming and getting state funding and support for that. And so, you know, for a long time I've been fortunate enough to work with a bunch of talented people who've been working to reform um, one of the country's worst performing systems for a long time, and, um, and that work continues, obviously. Um, I'm going to start out with some political kind of inquiries. So mm-hmm. how do you, you know, people seem to be fairly optimistic about what's going to happen during this session. Mm-hmm. Have you, if you've been involved with this for so long, how are you feeling <laughs> about, about yeah, things? Yeah, strangely optimistic, and yeah. Yeah, I think many of us are thinking about this in the long term. Um, you know, nothing's going to happen overnight, there is no uh, silver bullet. It has taken us more than 150 years to build this really obtuse and strange system and at least 40 plus years since the war on drugs and things of that nature to see the negative uh, trajectory of the acceleration of these negative outcomes, I should say. Um, So it's going to take us a while. What's exciting is we have a few things that have fallen into place. You have a governor who is thoughtful but moderate, who um, comes out of the military, his family is law enforcement, his brother's a sheriff, his dad was a sheriff. He really understands and has given some thought to what it means to create safety in communities, but also is uh, looking at the data, looking at the evidence. To your point, we worked with the Pew Research Center, as have many other states, including many southern states, to say, what does the evidence tell us? Not our emotional beliefs or our traditions as to whether we're performing. And um, what we're finding is that we're not performing well. We knew that already. Now what we have is the information that tells us why we're not performing well. The practices that create over-incarceration. It gives me some optimism that you have conservative legislators taking leadership, filing bills and um, taking leadership in areas that they haven't. You have members of the Black Caucus and the Democratic Caucus who've been working on these issues saying, Yes, this is great. There is a moment. You have members of the business community who haven't been as involved now taking cues from their friends in Texas, in Alabama, in Georgia, and Florida saying it's time for us to be right on crime, smart on crime. It's been great to have them at the table to broaden the voice of reason around what it means to create um, reform. And you have the ever-important faith community really stepping up both, quite frankly, liberal and conservative faith communities saying we have to do something about this and our belief systems are driving us. And and they're joining uh, the advocacy community and and obviously the men and women in prison who've been in prison who are now out, their families and friends who have been clamoring for change and um, for a smaller way for us to do this. So what do you think the task force made... um I'm forgetting, but I think it's 27 recommendations. They made a number of recommendations that span a whole range of issues. Are there a couple that you thought, you know, you feel most strongly about? I know it's supposed to be a package. I understand. (laughs) So the package does work together. Right. Um, So that's important. But um, obviously, 
From the perspective of bringing the numbers down, we just, and the governor said this clearly, we need to be bold and courageous so that we're just not number one anymore because it sends a terrible signal and because we're destroying Louisiana families, right? I think it's important for people to recognize that it's not just that, oh, it's bad that we're over incarcerated. We're investing in things that are actually bad for families and communities and that make us unsafe. That's the deal. And so if you look at um, some of the bills carried by um, Senator Dan Martini, Senator Dan Clater, um, um, Senator John Valerio, Senate presidents actually, taking leadership on this, those things are designed to actually reduce the numbers by creating parole eligibility for people um, who may have committed crimes, or in some cases absolutely did, uh, but they're reformed. So this notion of redemption is a consistent and strong theme in this narrative of reform, that people who have been in prison 15, 20, 25 years, many of the families who they committed crimes against are saying, it's time for them to come out and be contributing members of society. It's time for them to come back to their children and families and do something. And by the way, we're spending a fortune keeping them in prison. And it doesn't make sense for them to be model prisoners uh, when they could be out in society contributing to society. And quite frankly, we not have to pay for that. We can take those resources as um, some of the bills that have been filed um, suggest Representative Walt and others have bills that say we take them the reinvestment of those dollars and we invest them in evidence-based, research-based, and experience-based approaches that help us with people on probation and parole and make sure that they don't recidivate, give them support to get housing and jobs, and they may need um, additional assistance by way of health care or emotional well-being supports, right? Um, those are things that the evidence tells us will help create um, less incarceration, reduce the level of recidivism, and actually keep us safer. What's amazing about it um, is other southern states have picked up on that, and so now we're able to see their progress. If you look at Texas, if you look at Georgia, Florida, uh, they've already done justice reinvestment. In some cases, they've seen double-digit returns, and that is a reduction in recidivism and a reduction in incarceration in the double digits, and they're able to reinvest that money into things that work for families and communities. So you've been working on these issues for a while, but um, uh, last year you you had a member of your immediate family yeah. murdered. Uh, when you became a, I, I guess, a personal victim of sure. crime, and I don't know if you have been before yeah. that, did that change your perspective? How, how did that make looking at these issues yeah. different? You know, it's a tough thing, right? You, you, you have emotions and feelings about it. So my son was murdered last year on May 22nd, and um, what is it, April 21st, whatever today is, and his murderer still hasn't been found. One of the things that myself and the thousands of murder victims and their families in Louisiana, there are a lot of people, um, only, if only you take New Orleans, there are thousands of us, right? Um, what we're finding is that the system tells us very pointedly and has so very strongly for many years, well, if you allow us to just lock up everyone and to over-police your communities, that's going to keep you safe. What we're finding is that it, has, it is not keeping us safe, right? So our boys and men, and unfortunately children and women, are being killed, raped. We have other crimes. And in many cases, police and district attorneys are not finding and prosecuting those people. In New Orleans alone, the clearance rate is down to 27%. Last year it was 30 some odd percent. The national clearance rate is 62%. You get the picture. And so there is a disconnect between this narrative that we hear from some members of law enforcement when they say, district attorneys in particular, you gotta let us prosecute at the highest level, lock people up for long terms because that's going to keep you safe. It is not keeping us safe because they're not even finding the people who are most likely to do harm to us. And so I think people like me and many, many hundreds of other advocates and policy members and funders and elected officials and faith members and others, business community, we're saying, listen, we have to pay attention to the data and the evidence. Um, so often you'll hear this thing where they say, well, the survivors are really um, interested in people never getting out of prison. Some survivors believe that, others do not. 
And so there has to be, I think, a, a more fulsome, um, transparent, honest representation of how people feel about these things. And then that has to be matched with the evidence and data about what actually keeps us safe. And what you'll find is often people like me um, and my family are not necessarily of the belief that folks should be thrown away forever. Uh, it depends on the circumstances. And so we, you know, we're still trying to rationalize that. One of the things the governor asked when he asked me to serve just a month after my son's murder was, you know, would you bring that perspective? I want to do this well. I want to make sure the task force has as many perspectives as possible. And, um, and I decided I would, you know, bring my experience to that space. And so. Yeah, I think um, we have been hearing from the district attorneys in particular. The sheriffs have been a little bit more touch and go. They, sure. They've come out more strongly recently, but yeah. uh, about sort of the specter of whether our victims are really, you know, mm -hmm. on board with all of this. Um, I think that I know I have heard from corrections officials, um, maybe Secretary LeBlanc, but definitely Natalie LeBord, mm -hmm. who, is, who works at corrections, um, that, you know, even in cases where the, the survivors have gone through a mediation process or whatever mm -hmm. with, with um, the offender, mm -hmm. And they are on board with this person, maybe yeah. getting out or being released. That that's not an option because we have such strict mm -hmm. um, guidelines in place. So I think I think you're right. I think there is a mm -hmm. a broad spectrum. Um, do you? I mean, do you think it? it uh, the other thing. <laughs> well, you know, I think one of the things connected to what you're saying that we found with Pew mm -hmm. was that Louisiana has had um, the most dense set of legislative actions to restrict our options in those cases, right? So you've seen over the last 15 to 20 years um, more than 80 separate pieces of legislation that restrict or eliminate probation or parole, oh. or parole or sort of options. Um, and that's been one of the reasons why we have such um, a large population, and it's one of the reasons why those families that you're talking about, we got to meet many of them over the nine plus month period, and they came to uh, the town hall sessions, they came to the task force meetings and said, you know, we're just not for this anymore. We believe differently. Uh, you know, we haven't had the option. No one's listening, and so you either have legislative or legal uh, barriers that prevent parole eligibility. Um, you also have a prosecutorial practice. You have a situation with the DAs like the one in New Orleans and others, who even when someone is proven innocent with DNA, they want to go back and try to prosecute those folks again. Um, so it's just in a very, it's a very aggressive approach. It's not data informed. It's not informed by the best practices and the information that tells us what can help keep us safe. And they are really a large source of not just the over incarceration, but people should be reminded we're spending between 700 million and a billion dollars a year statewide on the system while we're cutting higher education. We, have, we don't have increases to the K-12 budget. We have struggles with our healthcare budget. Things that actually increase safety, things that improve the quality of life for people, and things that actually grow jobs in Louisiana are being put to the wayside, if you will, because we're investing so much in incarceration that doesn't so what do you say, because I, I, I think that there is a broad spectrum of, of people who are survivors or who have relatives mm -hmm. who are victims of violent crime. I have heard from some people who sure. are um, understandably traumatized yeah, absolutely. Um, and very worried about what, what is being proposed. Yeah. Particularly, and this is totally anecdotal, I have gotten several emails from um, rape survivors who, yeah. who seem to be concerned. Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, I, I'm assuming you've talked to some of these people sure. who might be on the, on the opposite end of that mm -hmm. spectrum, and, and 
um, what do you say to them? Well, you know, we're a country of laws, and that implies a sort of intentional tension between mm -hmm. people with different opinions, people who've had different experiences, and even people who've had the same experience who come to different conclusions right. about what we should do as a society about these things. And so I think it's totally fair mm -hmm. for people who've had those experiences or for their family members to have had those experiences to feel really strongly about that. Now, in those cases, I think it's important for us on either side of the argument to mm -hmm. go back to the data and try to reconcile how we should act as a society since we are not necessarily in consensus. The data tells us that one of the things that we do have to pay attention to um, is sexual violence. Not in all cases, but in some cases, sex crimes are a very unique um, kind of violent crime. It's very different than armed robbery or murder or things of that nature. And so I think some attention should be given to what it means to make sure that people who have committed um, sex crimes who may be repeat offenders because of some psychosis, for lack of a better yeah. way of putting it, that we look at that. The task force looked at that. I think what you're going to see reflected in the legislation, um, especially as it gets shaped up and people have more input, is accommodation for that. It's important to remember, though, we're not talking about releasing people. We're talking about parole eligibility. So there's a parole board that will get the entire file, get all the information, and make really we hope high quality decisions that can decipher between, you know, some guy who was maybe a part of an armed robbery 15 years ago, who's now a model prisoner who has aged out of, of crime 40 plus years old, versus someone who is a repeat rapist, who probably is not a great candidate for the kind of, uh, the kind of reform that we're talking about. Um, I think what's remarkable is that those of us who are the most staunch advocates for reform are still saying that we are not in favor of dangerous people uh, being released out into our communities because they're our communities also. These are our families as well. Um, and so we want to focus on that. Well, the line we're drawing is that the argument being made by DAs and, and some police departments and sheriffs and others is in fact not true often. They are over-incarcerating people. We incarcerate three times as many nonviolent offenders in Louisiana as other southern states, it's not helping us with our crime rate. So we have to stop doing that. In addition to that, we're sending people to jail for longer terms than the research and evidence tells us works. So you have people like Sheriff Mike Kaz, you have Sheriff Weber and others, because they know these inmates the most. They spend more time with them than anyone. They're saying our experience is 10 years, 30 years, the 30 years is a waste. If we can get a person in, offer them the kind of high quality services and the opportunity to reform themselves, we call it the Department of Corrections. It does a terrible job uh, helping people correct their lives because we haven't made the investment. If we can do that, if we can um, put these reforms in place and pass these bills, we think it's a great opening that leads us to um, better performance of the system and in ways that will keep us safer and reduce the likelihood that violent crime will actually happen. Can I ask you a thing one more question? <laughs> <laughs> um, that's that's a, a kind of an adjacent topic. Sure. Um, our, we had a reporter, Ken Daly, wrote, I think last week, about mm -hmm. the, the clearance of sure. murder cases and the... Yes maybe the troubles or struggles that the homicide unit mm -hmm. and in the NOPD is having. What yeah. I mean they, I saw you retweeted the article, so um I was wondering if the if if you had any comment on that, how you think maybe yeah. that could get Yeah. So improved? for a long time I um have believed and continue to believe in the power of government. I believe mm -hmm. government has a strong and potent and powerful role in improving the lives uh, of its people. And um, so that's really how I've built my career and my life and it's what I believe personally. Mm -hmm. And so I get a chance to work with government locally at the state level, at the federal level a lot because we believe that's where a lot of the opportunity is. In this instance, my personal experience um, has been one um, that says the, the police department in the homicide division is not staffed appropriately to accommodate 
the solving of these murders. The research and evidence tells us, and common sense tells us, that if you actually find people who kill people, it is likely that you'll bring the murder rate down because those same people are likely to kill again. Right. Um, those same people are likely to have retribution revisited upon them, um, if you will, in the streets. And so over time, you're able to reduce murders. I think in a general sense, it's fair to say that this administration here in New Orleans and Mayor Landrieu's team um, have done initially a good job of reducing the murder rate. We saw those numbers. Mm -hmm. um, and while it's early, the evidence uh, uh, about whether or not the Homicide Division is staffed the way it should be is strong. It isn't. And it has to be staffed better. It, have to, it has to have more homicide detectives. They have to be given the provisions and the resources to succeed. Um, and that's the case. And that's not throwing a brick at anybody or anything like that. But this is serious. And it, it can't be subject to the typical politics or the discussions about the budget. I don't think anyone gives a damn. If we can't put the resources, both the financial and the strategic resources, to make sure that we have the homicide division well staffed, everything else is for naught. If we care about public safety, we're going to have to make sure we do that work. I just happen to think there needs to be more urgency put into it. And, um, you know, I'd like to be a part of helping do that. Um, and hopefully other folks will also. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for being on Facebook Live. Well, thanks for having me. <laughs>